Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the session on social inequities, the built environment, and road safety. My name is Paul Bowes, and I'll be your moderator for the session. Just a few housekeeping items to quickly mention before we get started. Conference interpretation service is available by clicking the planet sphere icon at the bottom right of your screen and select your language preference. Ignore the feed loop language um, selection in the top corner of your screen. For questions, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the, uh, your video screen to submit questions. If there's time, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Throughout the conference, we encourage you to post social media using the hashtag, hashtag CARSPRI2021. Any post with that hashtag will also appear on the social wall in the lobby. Um, so uh, we'll get started. We have six speakers, so we're going to have to move smartly between them or among them. So we'll start with uh, Linda Rothman, who's going to talk about active school transportation in the built environment across Canadian cities, findings from the Child Active Transportation Safety and the environment study. Linda, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's uh, nice to be here today. Um, would be nicer to be in person, but hopefully we'll all be able to get a lot out of the session. Um, as Paul said, I'm presenting part of uh, some of the results from the Chase study. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Chase study at the beginning, um, and I'll, quite a few of the other speakers are also involved in the study that will be speaking in this session. Um, I'm from Ryerson University and from the Hospital for Sick Children, as well as the University of Toronto, and the uh, um, investigators on this particular part of Chase are from the International de la Research Scientifique in Montreal, University of Calgary, York University, Parachute, and Simon Fraser University. So just a quick rundown on Chase. This was, um, we're ending the near, a, a lot of you may have already heard about Chase and we've been presenting over the years um, from the, this project. It was a five year intersectoral research grant from CIHR and it was looking at how the built environment influences children and adolescent active transportation and risk of injury across different Canadian urban and actually suburban settings as well. Um, so we had three major objectives from this study. One was to look at um, travel, active travel. The other one was to look at safety. And the third one was to look at um, ensuring integrated knowledge translation and built environment planning. And we're getting presentations from all parts of uh, these objectives today. Lots of partners from all different sectors, um, hospitals, universities, knowledge users, um, municipalities, pri some private um, uh, people as well. So we've, we've got a wide variety and very multidisciplinary team that have been putting input into the, this wide project. Um, the main centers are Vancouver, um, with Surrey as a suburban area, Calgary, Montreal with Laval, and Toronto with Peel Region. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is specifically um, objective one, um, which is child and adolescent active transportation. I actually put the pedestrian and cycling injuries in as part of objective one, but it's actually objective two. So um, we will be eventually talking about pedestrian and cycling injuries, but for this presentation, it's just the active transportation part. So we do know that active school transportation is an uh, excellent source of regular physical activity as it's associated with healthier body weight, cardiorespiratory fitness, and we also know that active lifestyles and children can carry over into um, how they behave um, in terms of their physical activity into adulthood and also um, affect their transport decisions later on. Um, according to participation, 61% of Canadian children are not achieving physical activity guidelines. And we have seen a steady decrease in walking to school um, from 56% to 37% from over 10 years from 2016. 2006 to 2016 in Toronto. So that's not a good thing. And we, we do wanna be encouraging um, this type of physical activity for, uh, for children. So we also know that there are environments that 
promote active transportation in um, environments that don't promote active transportation. But when you look in the literature, and we've done, um, we did do a big systematic review a few years ago, there's very inconsistent findings about which built environment factors and road design features actually are associated with more active school transportation. So the question that we had was, are these differences due to differences in research methods, for example, spatial units, the time of day, or are there actual differences in effects um, in terms of what's important in terms of the built environment across locations? So we figured that studies that use a consistent methodologic approach across multiple cities was needed, and that's how we got going on this as part of CHASE. Our methods, um, we selected JK to eight regular program schools from each of the cities, and uh, we collected data in the spring of 2018 and 2019. They were stratified by socioeconomic status and walk score, um, which uh, is basically um, includes proximity to amenities, but also some very um, composite things with respect to intersection densities and block size and things like that. We sent two university student observers that we trained to schools to count the number arriving by active school transportation for 20 minutes before and five minutes after the school bell. And there were a total of 50, 552 schools across all the cities. And you can see here the, the red is what percentage of the eligible schools were included. Um, Vancouver, there was only 67 schools, so we were able to include all. But in some of the other schools, we actually had to do some um, some um, randomized uh, selection within our walk score and socioeconomic status quartiles uh, and able to get all the, the school counts done. So you can see what the samples were like. We created um, with the help of our uh, geographer, Marie Soleil Cloutier in Montreal, a very rich geospatial data set looking at school and neighborhood characteristics. So those are more things like um, um, socioeconomic status, recent immigration. We also had uh, uh, some density variables, diversity variables in terms of land use, and a lot of things related to design. Um, we did one set of design variables that we measured at the buffer level, we call it, within a thousand meters using um, city supply data sources to map on. So things like minor roads, where the traffic coming on, where the older houses were, but we also did a site survey where people actually walked around the roadways that were directly around the schools um, and did some more, um, more specific to the school site uh, um, items such as bike infrastructure, designated drop-off areas. So again, the uh, design variables were on two different levels. And you can see here on the left, this is how we did the mapping and we created for the, for the uh, thousand meters. We would like uh, map traffic signals as points, bike paths is linear, and then aerial things um, in terms of population density, and then we created a, an area with all these um, different variables within them. And then this is an example of the site survey, so in all the adjacent um, roadways, we collected the site survey information. Our outcome was active school transportation. We wanted to look at the social and built environment correlates of active school transportation. And we did a beta regression analysis because we had a proportional outcome. And we did um, an all cities model with the random effects stratified by city. And then we did city specific models. So for each city we did a model and we produced odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals. I just wanted to show this. This is kind of, you know, the bottom line is we have very wide variability in what proportion of kids are actually using after school transportation across cities. So ranging from 70% in Montreal down to 40% in Laval. Um, and you can see that very few kids are actually biking to school uh, in the red. Um, other active transportation in the green would have been kids coming um, scootering or other types of wheeled transportation. So we do have a huge degree of variability across these cities. And what we want to know is why this is happening. The other thing I wanted to point out is not only was it for um, variability within the cities, there was a lot, or sorry, across cities, there's a lot of variability within the cities. So even though close to 100, like within the, um, in Laval, you had some schools that had 0% showing up uh, using transportation all the way to 100% of the kids counted. 
So if you can see that, you know, every there, there's such variability um, between the schools. And again, this is something we wanted to understand a little bit more why. So I do want to point out that there's huge degrees of variability, not only in the act of transportation, but in the built environment between the cities. So for example, the child population density in Montreal, it's a very dense city, 1,256 kids per kilometer squared versus 500 in Calgary, so much less dense. Walk scores in Montreal were 77 versus 46 in Surrey out of 100. Um, let's skip down to the survey streets. Crossing guards range from 73% on those um, in those uh, buffers compared to 12% in Vancouver. And what was really interesting is on the little roadways around the schools, 0% cycling infrastructure around the schools in Calgary and 100% of the roadways had it in Vancouver. So you can see that there was a, a large variability in the built environment between the cities. In the all cities model, which what we did find was um, pretty cons like consistently related uh, to active school transportation was a higher child population density, higher traffic signal density, showing kind of more interconnected uh, roadways to school, greater walk scores, more adult crossing guards, more local roads, more um, cycling infrastructure. Um, but uh, lower residential land use was related to less AST. And we figured that was because um, these areas might have been more spread out. So it was um, a longer distance to get to school when there was lower residential land use within the buffer. When we did the city specific models, it was a little bit harder because the sample sizes were quite small. So the results were unstable, but we did find general findings were similar to the overall model However, there was more variability in the strength of associations between the different cities. So within most cities, we found it, again, it was related to, uh, AST was related to higher child population density, walk scores, school crossing guards, and higher local road densities. But there was a little bit more variability within um, traffic signal density, cycling infrastructure, and designated school car drop off. So things weren't as consistent with those, but again, we were playing with small numbers. So the question that I posed at the beginning, are inconsistent findings related to the associations between the built environment and active school transportation reflective of difference in the methods? So example, spatial units, time of day, or actual differences in effects across locations. And our multi-city um, Canadian study found that Several municipalities an average of over 60% of children using AST, but with a high degree of variability between schools with room, a lot of room for improvement. And the differences in the AST between cities reflect variability in their built environment. So think uh, the places like Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto with higher densities versus Calgary, PL, Surrey, and Laval had lower densities and were more suburban. So the answer to my question in green is there's actual differences across locations when we're using the same methodology um, to look at all of them. So the bottom line that we wanted to, um, to, to say what our, what, as a result of the study was the diversity and associations between AST and built environment observed between cities suggests that Directing interventions at the local neighborhood level may be the most successful in influencing active school transportation, rather than there's assuming that there's a one size fits all solution in terms of interventions. So we can't apply the same things to all places because of differences in the built environment. Um, and our next steps for the study um, that Naomi, who you'll be talking to in a little bit, um, are to examine the safety outcomes, including pedestrian collisions and also vehicle speeds with respect to uh, the CHASE study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Um, does anybody have any questions? Just type them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Um, right now, there aren't any, but I, I had a question in terms of, um, did you have to get the school boards to approve um, participation? And, you know, anytime you're working with children, there's a heightened level of um, concern. So we had, we did have ethics and we had um, approvals from the school boards. We didn't need approval from each individual school because um, we're standing on public property. And I mean, we did 
for sure we went and told the principals before, but they didn't really have to sign any consents or anything like that. So we, were, we weren't identifying people, we were standing on public property and we were just counting. So again, all the school boards we had approvals from, but not necessarily from the individual schools. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, next we have Linda again, talking about the evaluation of Vision Zero school safety zones and built environment interventions in Toronto, Canada, a pilot study. So Linda, back to you. Okay, um, this study was a little bit different. It wasn't directly under the Chase umbrella, but involved all the, or some of the same players in the Chase study. Um, and this, um, the study was, uh, we were asked to do this by the City of Toronto Transportation Services. So um, I just wanted to introduce uh, the people that were directly involved in the study, because it was actually interesting. It was a very much a multidisciplinary collaboration. So we had epidemiologists um, from SickKids, uh, University of Calgary, York University, um, our, our, one of our geography colleagues, John Buehling from University of Toronto, Mississauga, Parachute, who is our injury prevention organization. But we also worked really closely um, on this project with uh, the policymakers and the knowledge users, including the Toronto District School Board people, the City of Toronto Transportation Service people, and also um, Green Communities Canada. So as probably all of us know, Vision Zero um, started in Toronto in 2017. And the basic principles is that we want to uh, prevent death and serious injuries and remove the, the focused responsibility of road safety from the individual. Um, we want to make sure that the roadways are safe and forgiving of human error. Um, we want to, we, we want it focuses on vulnerable road users. And again, Vision Zero is one of the premises is it should be um, data-driven and evidence-based interventions that we're using for Vision Zero. Um, part of the Vision Zero concept in Toronto were the creation of these school safety zones where they did some physical environment changes, some enforcement activities and education and school traffic facilitators. And again, the, re the goal of the whole thing was to reduce killed and serious injury collisions. So we were asked, well, first of all, um, we were asked to do the study around schools, which I'll go into a little bit more, but one of the focuses was on speed um, around schools, and because we know that traffic speed is a key risk factor for collisions and collision severity. Children have an almost three times higher odds of collisions on roads with mean speeds over 40 kilometers per hour compared to less than. And we, had, we did do another study as part of Chase actually, um, that we found that higher speed traffic is actually associated with less active school transportation in Toronto. So not only is there higher risk of collisions, we're also doing children a disservice by not, um, by providing an environment with a higher speed traffic is, is that it's prohibiting them from actually walking to school and getting the health benefits from that. So the city of Toronto put in, in this pilot project um, that we were asked to evaluate some small um, site, uh, some site-specific engineering um, um, uh, changes, which I'll talk about in a second. But, you know, when I look back into the literature initially, there's a lot of small site-specific engineering studies looking at the effectiveness of single interventions. So things like just evaluating lights or signs or markings in front of school. And, and they all have inconsistent results. When you just focus on like three schools with just lights, you don't see consistency. Um, also, although it's been found that lowering posted speed limits is quite effective in reducing speeds, there is a continued poor driver compliance over time. And what, when I was reading through stuff, I realized that the better effectiveness has generally been found with packages of interventions. So not just doing one thing, but doing a package of things. So things like there was an evaluation by DiMaggio in 2013 that did an evaluation of safe routes to school interventions. And they found collision rates decrease approximately 50% during school travel hours. So this was just not one thing. It was a whole bunch of different things they did together, including traffic calming, including some enforcement, including all sorts of things. So I really do think it's important when we're talking about Vision Zero to be thinking more about um, not just one intervention, but a package of intervention and how effective they are. 
So the objective of this study was to using a multidisciplinary collaborative approach was to examine this package of Vision Zero built environment interventions related to the school safety zone strategy on our primary outcome was vehicle speeds and some secondary outcomes were active school transportation and risky driving behaviors around the schools. It was a pre-post quasi-experimental control design. We had 34 schools that were part of this initial pilot program that were selected using a priority ranking system that I'll um, describe in a second. 13 of them uh, were, were done with the uh, interventions over 2017 to 2018 and 21 were done 2018 to 2019. And you can see in this um, map, uh, the, like the, the blue and the red were the three pilot schools they first started with, but the greens and the um, blue, the blue is 2017, the 2018 were green and they you can see they were quite well spread out across the city. So we had some representation across the city. We also matched 45 control schools on socioeconomic status using the after-tax low-income cutoff from the 2016 Canadian Census. And we actually took those 45 control schools, good thing I presented Chase first from the Chase study. So we had those control schools from the Chase study. The interventions that were put in were things that a few, um, watch your speed boards, um, some flashing beacons, some speed symbols, some school symbols, pedestrian crossovers. So there's a total number of 357 intervention types. So what I do want to call attention to is these were all, I like to refer to them as lines and signs. There wasn't any um, actual traffic calming or anything physically put in to, to slow traffic down, but it was either things to monitor speed, like the watch your speed board, or just, um, you know, flashing lights and lines to show that there was um, a school zone. Um, this is a bit busy, but what I wanted just to point out here is that they were mostly elementary school students. So there's, you know, the secondary schools were only, there's only four, four schools in the study. Most of the um, posted speed limits around the schools were at 40, but there was still quite a few at 50 and 60 kilometers. The frontage was on 50 and 60 kilometer posted speed limit areas. Um, traffic calming devices were observed uh, within the, in front of the school at about 60% in the intervention and about 40% at the control schools. School crossing guards, less than half of the schools had them. And um, this I wanted to show you were the priority criteria. This is how the, uh, the city chose which schools they were going to do first with this, um, with this pilot study. And basically it was with um, the, the the proportion of children living within 1.6 kilometers of school. So that could actually potentially walk to school. And you could see it was much higher in intervention schools and that's why they were intervention schools. And also the other things that they were looking at were the number of um, school children involved in collisions and just general number of collisions. So obviously these are all higher in the intervention versus control schools because that's how they were selected for priority. Now the control schools will eventually or would have eventually gotten interventions at some point as well. We did speed measurements from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, at the main frontage of school using pneumatic speed tubes over three days. And when I say we, I don't mean I don't mean the research team, but the city of, of Toronto uh, Transportation Services, um, and they they were great about getting these done on time, pre and post. Um, we looked at proportion exceeding the speed limit, the proportion exceeding 30 kilometers of an hour, and we like to use that as a delineation of when a child may or may or may not have a severe injury or a fatality. And we also looked at 85th percentile speed, which is a common measurement for engineers. Um, the active school transportation and risky driving, we were only able to do this for 21 schools just because of logistics. Um, I described how we did it in the uh, last presentations, the observers Went, two observers went and stood at two locations near the schools at the busiest car drop off and the busiest pedestrian arrival. And they counted the children using active transportation and um, we got a proportion of active school transportation. And the risky driving, we looked at nine different driver behaviors around the school. We couldn't count them. It's really difficult to count them, but we indicated whether or not the behavior was observed at the school. So it was a binary yes, no variable. We saw people backing up um, in front of the school, a dangerous backing up, or, or we didn't see it. 
not the best way to measure it, but we still are struggling with ways to measure risky driving in front of schools. So this um, graph shows you where we saw some changes. So the intervention schools are on the left, the control schools are on the right, pre is the white bars, post is the blue bars. The only difference that we saw post-intervention was in the proportion of vehicles going over the speed limit. And it wasn't a huge decrease. It went from 44% to 40%. And this note down here is that all of the reduction was actually seen within the 40 kilometer per hour posted speed zones. So not huge results. And then we'll talk a little bit more, a bit more about why I think that's the case. Active school transportation, we saw a non-significant, but just a little bit of an increase in active school transportation in the intervention schools post. Driver behaviors, we saw a decrease in six out of nine dangerous behaviors. Um, the most marked was drivers backing up dangerously and drivers not following traffic controls. Just of note, we saw at least one risky driving behavior at 97% of the schools pre-intervention. 65% of schools had more than three or, three or more bad behaviors. And the control schools also had decreases, but not as in many as many behaviors. So things like, you know, we, don't, we didn't see a lot of people um, texting or talking, not so much talking on the phone, but drivers waiting, blocking vision. What, we, what, what I remember seeing quite a bit is drivers dropping off children on the opposite side of the road and the kids running across mid block with no um, traffic controls to get to their schools. So what we saw was a high proportion of vehicles speeding in front of schools. Pre-intervention, close to half of all vehicles were exceeding the speed limit and approximately 75% exceeded 30 kilometers per hour in front of the school during school activity hours. Following interventions, we saw some very modest reductions in vehicles going over the speed limit from 44% to 40%. There was a trend towards increasing active school transportation and a reduction in risky driving. So what I take away from all this, and with a lot of discussion with people, is that we need to really start integrating more bolder interventions, not just lines and signs. Worked a little bit, didn't work, you know, as, as, like astoundingly great. Maybe there was some improvements. But, you know, with all the discussions we've been having with transportation services, um, they've added a lot more to their packages of what they're doing around schools, um, particularly right now, the automated speed enforcement, which is a huge deal. And we're seeing some great results with the automated speed enforcement around schools. And also uh, one of our other studies found quite a uh, decrease in collisions with the reduction in posted speed limit. So we do need to do things that are a little bit more drastic than just painting lines on the roadways to get some good results in terms of decreasing speeds and ultimately collisions. So speeding must be reduced around schools to create safer walking environments. And I do want to say that with this type of research, and that's why I enjoy it so much, is collaboration is the key to a successful and important and relevant evaluation. It, we can't just do it as epidemiologists. You can't just do it as traffic engineers. You can't, everybody has to work together to get to these, um, these vision zero oriented um, evaluations that make sense for everybody. But because we all have the common goal to make active school transportation safe for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, if anybody has any questions, type them into the Q&A section. Um, the, so Toronto has this big Vision Zero group and a budget and political support behind it, but how do you make these sorts of things work where that kind of political commitment has yet to be made by, by the municipal government or the school board or whatever? You know, I've been working on this Vision Zero stuff since it started in Toronto. And, you know, I was just talking to somebody about it today. There really has been, you know, initially there was a lot of negativity towards it um, publicly. There was a lot of bad press. Um, we've had our ups and downs in terms of collisions. Um, COVID has not helped. <laughs> There's been all sorts of weird changes in traffic patterns in Toronto as, um, as in other cities. 
Um, but I do feel like over time, there's been more and more um, adopt adoption of some amazing things going on in the city of Toronto, um, including the automated speed enforcement and the recognition that we need to do some more traffic calming and things like that. So I do think it's, it's a process and more people, are, more people are jumping on board with the language of Vision Zero and also the principles of Vision Zero. Um, the people, the, I remember the media was super critical of the fact that the, nothing was happening over the first few years. The collisions were actually getting worse in pedestrians. And all like we kept saying is you, you need to give this a little bit of time. Like it, it, it's, a, it, it's a culture shift. It really is. Um, we don't want any collisions happening on our roadways in Toronto, and, and there are cities who have achieved that with the Vision Zero principles. Thank you. Next, we have Naomi Schwartz, who's going to talk about the social inequities of child pedestrians and collisions in Toronto, the role of the built environment. Naomi? Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Naomi Schwartz. I'm a postdoctoral student at Ryerson University. I work with Dr. Linda Rothman. Um, so, I just want to acknowledge here the other authors of this work and the funding we got for this project from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, looking at child estrogen motor vehicle collisions um, by measures of equity in Toronto. So to start, um, motor vehicle collisions are one of the leading causes of death in children and youth in Canada, and they're considered the leading cause of death among children and youth globally. So pedestrians are particularly vulnerable on the road, and child pedestrians are even more vulnerable because uh, the less skills they have and experience in navigating road environments, but also because their smaller stature means they are less visible on the roads, and they may be struck higher on the body, which is associated with more serious injury uh, when they are hit. So it's very important to improve act active transportation in children, um, but it's also important that this can be done safely and that this safety is equitable across the population. So however, collisions are not uh, seen equitably across the population. So we've seen big inequalities in pedestrian injury in the, in the past. And here's just one study that was conducted in Ontario by Dr. Rothman uh, that looked at these inequalities and trends in it over time. So when emergency department uh, visits for pedestrian motor vehicle collisions across the province were stratified by the child's income quintile, you can see that more children in the lowest income quintile are injured, so at every time point. And over time, overall pedestrian motor vehicle collisions are decreasing, which is great. Um, but this decrease was not seen in the lowest income neighborhoods, where actually about a 14% increase was seen. So the biggest decrease of 22% was seen in the highest income groups. So not only do we have an important inequality in collisions, but these look like they're actually getting worse over time. Uh, it's unclear what the reason for these inequalities are. It may be that children in low-income households are walking more and so are more exposed to dangerous conditions. They may also be walking unsupervised if parents have time or transportation poverty. And the last option is that the built environment where children of low income are living is more dangerous. Uh, so just to expand on social indicators, there's a lot in the literature that show that low income status is associated with higher risk of child pedestrian collisions. Uh, there's less evidence available on other social indicators. So for example, among immigrant populations, some evidence from Europe suggests uh, far higher risk, but a study in Ontario found there was lower risk of overall injury and risk of, uh, of vehicle collision injury among new immigrants. For race or ethnicity, there are a number of studies showing higher risk among Black children in the UK and the United States, and among Hispanic children in the United States. So it's important to look at these effects in different contexts, as these factors are likely based on historical context, built environment, and marginalization in these places. 
Um, so expanding on why the built environment may be driving these differences, here's another study conducted by Dr. Rothman's team in Toronto, looking at built environment in high and low income neighborhoods. So you can see here visually that the red or the lowest income areas have very few speed humps and the blue or the highest income areas have many speed humps. We found that speed humps were four times higher in the highest income areas in Toronto compared to the lowest. Uh, they also found that local roads, uh, roads that have lower speeds were about 1.4 times uh, more common in the highest income areas. This is a very important inequality as speed humps are very effective traffic calming interventions. So based on a high quality pre-post study in Toronto, uh, it was shown about, there was about a 22% reduction in collisions and 43% reduction in child pedestrian collisions in, ch uh, in children after speed humps were added. So one reason this inequality may occur is uh, there's an inequitable process where there was for access to speed humps Traffic calming was until recently uh, mostly installed in Toronto by request from the neighborhood. So it was therefore most available to people who could access and navigate the system. So the study objectives of this, uh, of this study, uh, we wanted to look at the relationship between area level social indicators and child pedestrian collisions in Toronto. In Toronto is a large and diverse city um, from Statistics Canada, it's estimated that over 51% of the population identify as visible minorities. And Toronto also has a lot of diverse neighborhood types from the very dense downtown core to very suburban environments. Uh, as our second objective, we wanted to see whether these inequalities we see uh, across social indicators uh, uh, are driven by differences in the built environment. So the social indicators that we used were material deprivation from the Ontario Marginalization Index. And this is a score that combines factors from the census, like the percent of people without higher education and living below the low income cutoff. The other social indicators we used uh, is the proportion of the population that identified as recent immigrants, so immigrated within the last five years. And uh, the final indicator is the percent that identified as visible minority. And those came from the Canadian census. So for methods, we had Toronto police reported pedestrian motor vehicle collisions among children that were aged one to 17 between 2010 and 2018. So we mapped these collisions by census tract to get the area-based collision rates per kilometer of roadway across the city. And we used a negative binomial regression to model the effects of each of the social indicators on pedestrian collision rates, and each indicator was modeled separately. I included in these models different categories of the built environment, examining whether adding uh, groups of these factors will reduce the association between the social indicators and child pedestrian motor vehicle collisions. These built environment factors included things like traffic interventions, so things like speed humps, uh, density in the area, or bike lanes. Uh, the next group of features were features of the roadway. So things like the percent of roads that are major roads, so collector or arterial roads compared to local roads. And finally, we considered uh, land use features like the proportion of households that lived in multi-dwelling homes, so duplexes and apartment buildings, and the percent of land use dedicated to parks, residential, or commercial uses. We also created fully adjusted models considering all of these features. So I also conducted a spatial hotspot analysis called GSTAR that looks at whether there are identical, identifiable clusters of census tracts for census tracts where it and surrounding tracts are significantly above the average of all census tracts. And I looked at this for collisions and a number of other covariates. So for my results, between 2010 to 2018, there were over 2,000 child pedestrian collisions in Toronto. And when we examine the relationship with social indicators, uh, and these are all from fully adjusted models, we found that there was about 31% higher collisions in our deprived areas uh, and 58% higher risk uh, with each 10% increase in the proportion of recent immigrants in an area. For visible minority proportion, there was also an association 
uh, but it was weaker. So there was about a 9% higher uh, risk of collisions uh, for each 10% increase in visible minority population. So we tried looking for both recent immigrant and visible minority proportion to see if effects disappeared when we controlled for material deprivation. And this allowed us to see if effects for these indicators are mainly driven by their correlation with, dep with deprivation. So when this was done, immigration remained significant uh, even after controlling for effects of deprivation, uh, though it was estimated by about 10%, um, but visible minority did not. We also found that accounting for any of the built environment covariates did not have much of an effect on the relationship between social indicators and child pedestrian collisions. And I'll speak a bit more about why this might be later. So with hotspot mapping, we found six distinct clusters of child pedestrian collision hotspots in Toronto, uh, which you can see here on the first map. So the dark shades of red represent a hotspot with 99% confidence, while dark blue is a significant cold spot. So you can see that many of the collision hotspots uh, correspond to the material deprivation hotspots in the second map. So the first and large, the largest and most significant hotspot was in Toronto's northwest corner in the city, labeled number one. Uh, so in comparing this to dep the deprivation map, you can see that this is a highly deprived area in Toronto. It also corresponds to both a hotspot for visible minority, uh, with the population primarily identifying as Black, and uh, recent immigrant populations. So another uh, hotspot is seen here in the central east part of the city, labeled number two. Uh, and this is an immigrant cluster in Toronto with a high South Asian population. So when you look at hotspots uh, for speed humps, you can see that speed humps are mostly found in central Toronto, surrounding the downtown area, and this is a lot wealthier of an area. And many, many speed humps in places where they are needed most, uh, namely the big collision hotspots. So to summarize, our main findings are that social indicators uh, were related to high risk of child pedestrian motor vehicle collisions in Toronto. And while this association could not be explained by the built environment alone, it's likely that these associations are far more complex. So as we tried to explain uh, through this conceptual model. And it's related likely to mobility choices and transportation poverty of different groups. One thing that has been seen in past studies is that children who are lower income and live in dangerous road environments do not have a choice and walk even where collision rates and speeds are higher. So this may explain how a dangerous built environment might differentially affect marginalized populations. So though in this cross-sectional study, we did not see an effect of built environment features like areas with more traffic calming or lower speed roads on lower collision rates. Uh, this is in contrast with studies that were better positioned to look at the effects of things like speed humps and lower speed limits, uh, and that those found strong reductions in collisions after they were added. So one reason uh, is the cross-sectional nature of the study, and it's that these measures are also used to infrequently to detect an effect. So less than 5% of roads in Toronto have any speed hump segments and a full 307 of over 500 census tracts used in the study uh, had no speed humps at all. So given that these are especially rare in low income and marginalized areas, it's difficult to detect their effect on reducing collisions and whether they might modify the association to social indicators that we see. Well, in conclusion, this work further highlights important population inequalities in child uh, pedestrian motor vehicle collisions. Children in low income neighborhoods and with a higher proportion of recent immigrants have higher risk of collisions and with transportation poverty are likely walking more. So based on principles of equity, these neighborhoods should also be greater targets for effective traffic calming measures like lower speed limits and speed humps. And yet we often see the opposite with more of these in more privileged areas. Addressing these disparities will require an equity and evidence-based approach to road safety with interventions that allow safe walking environments for all children. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of comments that came up uh, in mm -hmm. the chat. 
One is that um, there was a similar study, a thesis study done in Montreal years ago by Mary France Jolie. Person wanted you to know that. And one that kind of was addressed. Do you agree that you should have specific design criteria for roads around schools? Thank you. Um, yeah, a big part of our project is we're also looking, this was in census tracts across the city, but we are also looking specifically around school areas and future studies to look at effects of, of things like social indicators and road safety features around schools. Perfect. Thank you. Next, we have Janet O'Coin an investigation of the built environment risk factors related to specific mechanisms of injuries between children and adolescents in three Canadian cities. Janet. Thanks so much. So as mentioned, my name is Janet and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary. And today I'm going to be briefly discussing a project that investigated built environment risk factors and different mechanisms of injuries between children and adolescent bicyclists. And I do want to acknowledge the large number of authors and collaborators that have been contributing to this study. Oh. I am unable to move to, there we go. So as mentioned, this project is part of the larger CHASE study. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that. And we are shifting a bit more now towards bicycling injuries. So bicycling as a form of physical activity and active transportation for all ages has been shown to not only benefit the health and physical literacy of children, but it also benefits our environments, the, the economy, and can contribute to further fostering and improving our communities. Unfortunately, despite these recognized benefits, we have been seeing an ongoing decline in child participation in bicycling. In previous studies that have discussed this decline with children and their parents, one of the key concerns and barriers to participation that is brought up has to do with traffic-related injury and safety. Unfortunately, these concerns are founded and are a public health concern that does need to be addressed. So as mentioned, unfortunately, while bicycling is a healthy behavior with potential long-lasting effects, it can result in a significant number of injuries for children. Here in Canada, injuries are the leading cause of death and disability in individuals and in children, with a majority happening on road. And it has been acknowledged that the majority of these injuries are predictable and preventable. So specific to bicycling injuries, they are a leading cause of emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths in Canadian children annually. And a majority of these unintentional injuries we are seeing in Canada do occur on road. This is particularly concerning given that previous research has demonstrated a fourfold increase in severe bi child bicycling injury risk when there is motor vehicle involvement. So there's a clear need for additional injury prevention strategies to be implemented at the population level to begin addressing these child injuries so that children are provided the opportunity to be physically active and to choose to bike in a safe environment. One of the most promising strategies to address child bicyclist injuries are modifications to the built environment. So previous research has demonstrated that bicycle specific infrastructure such as physically separated bicycle lanes can reduce injury risk in adults. However, there is very little research that has been done in youth under age 18. So determining child specific bicycle in, or bicycle environment injury relationships with the built environment is imperative given that children do interact with their built environment very differently than adults and may be increasingly vulnerable due to their ongoing development and to their size. Additionally, there is little known about whether built environment risk factors differ between children and adolescents, which may be an important consideration when we are implementing built environment interventions and in understanding where children and adolescents are choosing to bicycle. 
So the purpose of this study was to compare the mechanisms of injury being falls or collisions and different built environment risk factors between children aged 5 to 12 and adolescents aged 13 to 17 in three Canadian cities. So that I do want to mention this project is part of a much larger Canada-wide study that is using a case crossover design, and it is called the bike study. And so for this bike study and the case crossover design, participants are contributing data from not only their injury locations for our cases, but they also contribute to control locations from along their injury route. This means that for our larger bike study, comparisons for cases and controls are not only within child, but also within trip. However, for the purpose of this project, we have restricted our data to the participants injury site. So the bike study is recruiting child bicyclists aged five to 17 who present to one of three participating children's hospitals in Canada, the BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, the Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary, and the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Following screening for eligibility, children, children and families are then contacted by study team members in each city to arrange an interview. And our eligibility criterion really is placing emphasis on bicycling for physical activity or active transportation in an urban environment and really placing the emphasis on the built environment. So once recruited to the study, participation involves a 30 to 45 minute semi-structured interview with the eligible child bicyclist. And the primary goal of these interviews is to determine not only the location of the injury, but also the route that led to the injury. During this time, we are asking children about the circumstances of their injury, the environment at their injury location, as well as those control sites that we select their perceived safety at the site, as well as personal information related to their bicycling experience. And during these interviews, we do have children not only recreate the routes, but we also provide them the opportunity to draw their built environment, as you can see here. So the case and control sites that we collect through the interview are then provided to a trained auditor for a structured and objective in-person site audit. These auditors are blinded to the site's injury or control status. And during these audits, we collect very detailed information about the built environment, the traffic at that area, the type of route, the grade, surface quality, visibility, and the presence of any traffic calming devices. So this study is ongoing and it is still ongoing until October 2021. To date, we have recruited 285 participants and you can see here the recruitment breakdown across the three cities. For this study, or for this project, we did look at just basic frequencies for the different mechanisms of injury and different built environment risk factors between the children and adolescents. So our sample to date of these 285 participants, 69 self-reported their gender as male, and there was a mean age of 10 years. For their mechanism of injury, we can actually see that there was a similar number of falls compared to collisions that were experienced. However, as of interest, when we actually stratified by age, we saw that this relationship changed slightly. So you can see here that in respect to mechanism of injury, the children who are aged five to 12 were more likely to report a fall compared to adolescents aged 13 to 17, who more frequently reported experiencing a collision as their mechanism of injury. When the mechanism of injury was a collision, children more frequently reported colliding with other bicyclists and natural features such as trees and bushes compared to adolescents who more frequently collided with motor vehicles and built environment features such as bollards, poles, and curbs. So now getting into a few more built environment risk factors. Adolescents were more frequently injured in intersections than children, as you can see, with 29% compared to 8% of the injuries. 
We also then looked at the frequency of collisions that occurred at an intersection and found that in adolescence, 30% of the reported collisions occurred at an intersection compared to children where only 15% of the collisions occurred at an intersection. This may be in part due to differences in where children and adolescents are choosing to cycle. So for their location of injury, children were much more frequently injured away from the road. So this meant parks, grass spaces, multi-use pathways that were not next to a road. Whereas adolescents, you can see with 62%, were more frequently injured on road compared to being on a sidewalk or away from the road. So for those injuries that did occur on road, children much more frequently reported being injured in a back lane or an alley compared to adolescents. And adolescents were slightly more likely at 17% compared to 10% to have been injured on a major arterial road. In children, we found that 92% were injured in a residential area compared to 77% of adolescents when we looked at land use at, that, at their injury location. Again, further suggesting a difference in areas where these groups may be bicycling and adolescents were more frequently injured in com commercial areas. So for road grade, you can see that there were no real observed differences in road grade at the injury site when comparing children and adolescents. However, we can see that in both groups, there was a large proportion that did occur on a downhill grade, suggesting that there may be a very similar risk factor for both groups in respect to bicycling injuries. Similarly, presence of debris was looked at, and you can see that it was fairly common at the injury site for both children and adolescents, suggesting another fairly common risk factor. The type of debris, however, did differ slightly between groups with children more frequently reporting or having gravel observed at their injury site 38% of the time compared to adolescents 25% of the time. So this project so does suggest that there might be different risk factors and injury mechanisms for child and adolescent bicyclists. And by better understanding these differences and risk factors for bicycling injuries occurring in both children and adolescents and the different mechanisms of injury, we really hope to be able to better inform key stakeholders at all different levels as they develop different policies and interventions to not only increase bicyclist safety but also participation. It is really imperative that we start creating spaces that are not only safe for all ages, but that also account for potential different risk factors that may be experienced by the different age groups and the different usages of the environment that may be occurring between groups. We need to move towards creating an environment that is better suited to the needs of bicyclists for all ages and provides safer spaces that encourage more children to see the benefits of bicycling. So as mentioned, this study is, this project is part of a much larger, larger case crossover study that is looking at the built environment risk factors for child bicyclist injuries. So our next steps are going to be an additional examination of the different built environment features present at injury locations of child bicyclists, as well as our second objective for the bike study will be looking at a mixed effects logistic regression model that also incorporates the control sites to further determine built environment risk factors for child bicyclist injuries. And based on the findings of this specific project, we are going to be further exploring potential effect measure modification by age in our analyses. And I do want to briefly acknowledge again our incredible team of collaborators and researchers at all of the different sites who are contributing to this project. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have one question. I noticed in the beginning you had pictures of the infrastructure things that be, can be done, the advanced stop boxes for bikes or 
other infrastructure things. And then your data suggests that kids are mostly, the younger kids are mostly off road. If that's the case, how do they get to learn how to properly use those infrastructure things? Because there's an active piece of that for the cyclist. Absolutely. I would suggest a large part does have to do with parents. Um, one piece, a third objective of this study is actually a more qualitative study where we're talking to the parents and children about that specific feature of how do you use this? How could you be encouraged to use this space? And a lot of the children do say having a parent beside them in learning and actively having that active learning of how to use those different features as a key facilitator to that. So I'd suggest that that might be one potential avenue, but it is right. That was one key finding here is that children perhaps aren't using those spaces. Um, maybe we need to chat, talk to the children and see how we can create a space where they are encouraged to use those spaces or what barriers they are experiencing to those areas. Well, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, next, we have Emily McCullough, who's going to talk about barriers and facilitators to the built environment change across sectoral analysis illustrating the priority of vulnerable road users. Emily? There we are. Well, thank you very much and for that kind introduction. Um, as Paul said, my name is Emily McCullough and I am a postdoctoral fellow working under the guidance of Dr. Allison McPherson at York University and Dr. Sarah, Rich Sarah A. Richmond at Public Health Ontario, and I specialize in qualitative data analysis. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am a member of the York University community and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located and that precede the establishment of York University. I am honored to be standing on and presenting from the, the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Ashinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat, territory which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, and I am personally grateful for the opportunity to live and work on Treaty 13 land. Second, I would like to acknowledge my privilege and positionality as a white Western and Global North researcher who uses she, her pronouns and is cisgendered. So thank you for attending uh, this session today. And I like look forward to fielding any questions and engaging in meaningful discussion. So the work done today uh, within this project uh, could not have been possible without this dedicated research team. Um, as the next few slides will show, and I'll go through quite quickly, this is part of a larger study that my esteemed colleagues have already chatted about um, during their presentations. It also wouldn't be possible without the generosity of numerous partners and the support of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, University of Calgary, York University, Sick Kids Research Institute and Parachute. So just a quick agenda here. Um, I'll begin with an overview of the project from which these data are derived, a summary of the methods and analysis procedures, and then examples from the data in the form of qualitative excerpts. So uh, once again, just briefly, this is a component of the larger CHASE project, in particular objective three, which is to identify implementation strategies for built environment change at the municipal level to encourage AT, active transportation. So in particular, the third objective um, is, was narrowed down or re reframed to determine the barriers and facilitators associated with making BE changes that promote road safety. Um, and this section of the research prioritizes the experience professionals working in the fields of road safety and injury prevention in five Canadian municipalities, including Vancouver, Calgary, Peel, Toronto, and Montreal. 
So just some quick background information, the rationale for the scope of this study is underpinned by the concerns regarding high injury collision rates, the economic costs of transport incidents, and the disproportionate risk to those road users made vulnerable by the current built environment. Furthermore, research has also shown that modifications to the BE can reduce vehicle speed and increase safety. Qualitative data were collected by members of the research team in each municipality. Participants were recruited from municipal, transportation, police services, public health, nonprofit, school, school boards, and private sectors. The research team used a combination of snowball and purposeful sampling techniques to recruit participants. Key informant interviews were conducted with participants in each municipality between January to December 2019, and, a virtual, and virtual focus groups were held between July to November 2020. The original intention was to hold in-person focus groups. However, due to COVID-19 restrictions, focus groups were conducted virtually and used a third-party platform called Upwards to facilitate online discussion. So Braun and Clark's approach to thematic analysis was used to code and analyze the, de the data. Uh, this is a useful approach for identifying patterns and themes in reference to the research question, which once again, what are the barriers and facilitators to BE change decision-making? So a high-level analysis of the results um, identified five major barriers and four major facilitators to BE change. Barriers included motor vehicle prioritization, funding and resources, lack of political will, sectoral silos, residence resistance, and four major facilitators, data sharing, champions and advocates, cross-sectoral collaboration, and community consultation. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'll provide some examples from data excerpts from the participants across municipalities and, sec and sectors that illustrate these themes. So the first, motor vehicle prioritization, and there's an excerpt here from a Toronto participant in the uh, transportation sector. Quote, the consideration of motor vehicle volume and travel times and safety for vulnerable road users are often at opposite sides of the scale in balancing requirements, end quote. So, which according to participants, often results in the road needs of motor vehicle users taking precedent over those um, who are made vulnerable by the current uh, shape and status of the built environment. Funding and resources. So we, as this, quote, uh, this participant from Cal uh, Calgary in the municipal sector, quote, we spend a lot of money on infrastructure, primarily for driving, but it's really difficult to spend money on infrastructure for walking or cycling. And this shows a crucial link between the allocation of funding and priority of motor vehicles which function together as a significant barrier to BB change. Lack of political will. So a participant from Calgary's nonprofit sector, quote, political leadership, that is probably the biggest barrier to making the changes we need to make. A lack of leadership, an unwillingness to take the time to explain, to learn, all of that is very much lacking at the political level. End quote. So this passage illustrates that the pivotal role of politicians and leadership with regards to BE change. Often the decisions made by political leaders are influenced by election cycles and the status, status quo, which, according to these participants, is the prioritization of motor vehicles. Sectoral silos. A participant from Montreal's public health sector. Quote. It seems to me that governance, partnerships, and collaborations are crucial to our mission. However, the efforts put into these relationships are under-recognized and poorly supported, in general, like much of the work done in prevention." End quote. So this quote highlights the need for collaboration and communication across sectors. According to this Montreal participant, there currently is a lack of such collaboration, which functions as a barrier to build environment change.
residents resistance. So a participant from Peel's municipal sector, quote, there will always be residents who oppose any changes or controls. That is a given. There will also be opposition just because some residents don't want any change and don't want to listen to both sides of the issue, end quote. So this shows how a challenging part of the BE change process often involves navigating the opposing views of local residents. And the remaining slides, we will uh, take a look at some of the major facilitators. So uh, participant from Peel's public health sector, data sharing. A da quote, a data set for the region that links motor vehicle collisions, bracket, location, conditions, et cetera, and bracket, to individual characteristics such as health data, injury, and SES indicators. This would result in better understanding of the data and how it all fits together, end quote. So data sharing can also facilitate cross-sectoral collaboration and bring a health dimension to the BE change decision-making process that would account for vulnerable road users and the needs of, an, of at risk populations. Champions and advocates. This is a participant from Vancouver's private sector. Quote, having the support of the municipal local government to be available to put the right infrastructure in place is important. There are a lot of people who want to do active travel, and there are a lot of stakeholders that are on board with it. But then unless the environment is built around it to safely do that, it's hard to implement. As a first step, having the municipality or those engineers on board to make these programs run a lot better and faster. If we don't have buying from a local authority, it's tough." End quote. So this illustrates how champions and advocates are not only community members who see the need for changes, but also professionals working in these fields who are striving to make BE changes that serve road users who are made vulnerable by the current road environment. Cross-sectoral collaboration. And this is from a participant from Toronto's nonprofit sector. Quote, Interconnected interconnectivity between organizations and sectors saves time and can be educational. We all have experiences that we can share with others. Based on my experience, there are different teams in different organizations that are doing similar work, but we lack a mutual platform or connectivity." End quote. So according to participants, cross-sectoral collaboration can also overcome many barriers to BE change, such as lack of funding or lack of political will. By providing data that supports the need for BE changes to support road users made vulnerable by the current environment. Community consultation, and this is from a Montreal participant from the municipal sector. Quote, there is always a percentage of people who are resistant to the project. When we are able to have testimonials, when we are able to conduct pedestrian traffic, to document pedestrian traffic, my apologies, the satisfaction rate and the diversity of use, it is much more difficult to go out and publicly oppose the project for reasons which are often personal interests. That was a strategy. Documentation and communication have been our strategies to secure buy-in. So this shows how community consultation processes can overcome barriers of resident resistance. It can also include previously unheard voices with regards to the need for BE changes in particular neighborhoods and environments. However, participants also voiced some concerns regarding the accessibility and equity of community consultation processes. So a participant from Vancouver's public health sector, quote, it's complaints driven. So if we have complaints from parents, that raises a priority, awareness of those kinds of things. And we know that there are all kinds of problems with that, lots of equity issues. So some examples of those problems are that communities do not have the time or knowledge of their local political system to make their concerns heard and to engage with that process. Thus, relying on complaints processes as a form of community consultation is insufficient to determine the BE needs of some communities. So just briefly, some of the limitations of the study 
um, is that purposeful and snowball sampling techniques may have resulted in more similar views and opinions about the barriers and facilitators to PE change across municipalities and sectors compared to random. In addition, semi-structured interviews were conducted by different members of the research team in different regions, and thus the probing questions varied and elicited slightly different responses from participants. Lastly, the positionality of each interviewer may have affected participants' responses. And I'll end quickly just with some five key takeaways from this high-level analysis. Um, so first, motor, motor vehicles are prioritized in BE change decision-making, which dictates how funding and resources are allocated. Politicians have decision-making power and are influenced by the priorities of motor vehicles. My apologies. There, sorry about that. Um, third, more collaboration between sectors is required in order to make the changes that prioritize vulnerable road users, such as those between transportation and public health. This can also facilitate data sharing between sectors and the inclusion of more specific health data to be change decisions. Champions and advocates are key facilitators in promoting BE changes to support road users who are vulnerable. And lastly, the needs of community members and residents can impact BE change decision making. However, this can be an inequitable, inequitable process because not all communities have the time or knowledge to advocate for changes. Just a quick reference list uh, for the presentation recording. And thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to building any questions. Thank you. That was very interesting. I'm not really sure how you overcome lack of political will, but maybe elections are the answer. Um, last, uh, but certainly not least, we have Sarah Richmond, who's going to talk about using evidence as part of the decision-making pathway, a resource to assist practitioners in road safety. Okay, Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yep. It's not an, is it, um, is that better? Yep, that's better. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Paul. Again, my name is uh, Sarah Richmond. I am the uh, injury prevention lead in the Applied Public Health Sciences Unit at Public Health Ontario. Oh. Did you lose my screen? Uh, no, but it, the presentation part's come up. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm also an assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. I'm really pleased to bring you a presentation today that highlights the development of an online resource used to assist practitioners in road safety. I just want to start this presentation by thanking the Chase stakeholder team um, and, and users uh, particularly. They had an incredible involvement in this project which created a very relevant and user-friendly uh, product at the end of the day. So I'm just really grateful for their participation throughout the development of this tool. I'd also like to acknowledge the co-authors that are associated with the manuscript that is soon to come from this work, uh, particularly Claire Bucken, who is one of our PhD students that uh, did some data extraction across hundreds of studies that were considered for uh, this resource. Thank you, Claire. So as you all know, and why we are all here, injuries and deaths from motor vehicle collisions pose a very significant public health problem in Canada and in Ontario alone in 2019, the age standardized rate of emergency department visits due to injuries from motor vehicle collisions was just under 600 per 100,000 population in the province of Ontario. Typically, public health practitioners influence population health by addressing road safety through education and educational programs. However, another really important role that public health plays is advocating for effective changes to the built environment. 
This includes engineering changes such as physical changes to the road environment, such as um, segregated cycle lanes or um, multi-use trails. But from a policy perspective, really understanding the evidence that underlines these interventions in the context of collision prevention would be really helpful to public health and road safety practitioners. However, both public health and built environment practitioners in public health cite the lack of both accessible evidence and localized data, uh, specifically motor vehicle collision data at a local level as a significant barrier to developing a program of public health. Further, in some of the work that we had published in 2020, public health reported that specifically synthesized evidence on uh, intervention effectiveness was an identified gap. So the objective of this uh, project was to develop a resource, an online resource, for road safety practitioners to access evidence on the effectiveness of built environment interventions. And given that this project is part of the CHASE team, it's those interventions that are embedded in road safety policies in the urban municipalities participating in CHASE. So the process to complete this uh, resource and to develop this resource included an environmental scan that included a peer reviewed literature search as well as a gray literature search. As well as a critical appraisal process of the interventions found in the studies. We completed uh, a consultation process, a very iterative consultation process with both end users and stakeholders participating in Chase that included transport planners, public health practitioners, um, police services, those working in municipal transport safety, uh, those working in active and safe transport groups in the municipalities, school boards, um, as well as policymakers. We did um, some consultation with a digital design team at the British uh, the University of British Columbia that lent, lent their expertise to content development for the online tool and this presentation as well as a webinar that's being hosted on October 4th um, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern is sort of officially part of the launch of the Chase tool, which includes an evaluation that we hope to use um, the feedback that's collected from that uh, evaluation to inform future work in this area. So the environmental scan uh, was completed in the five urban municipalities that were participating in Chase. And as you know, that's uh, Toronto, Peel, Calgary, Vancouver, and Montreal. The articles were retrieved from citations within the policies themselves, but was supplemented from a peer reviewed literature search as well as a gray literature search. For that search, two independent reviewers searched for peer reviewed articles that were indexed in PubMed as well as Medline, and we completed a gray literature search in uh, Google Scholar. The terms that we use for both searches included road safety, built environment, motor vehicle collision, policy, and intervention. Inclusion criteria were those studies that examined BE interventions, reported a collision or a collision pathway outcome that included vehicle speed, vehicle volume, or yielding. We included all study designs in uh, the search and those studies that were published less than 20 years ago. Exclusion criteria were those that um, were not published in English, non-BE interventions, for example, those that are enforcement or education initiatives or interventions, uh, studies with outcomes other than collisions or collision pathway outcomes, for example, those looking at modal choice or those uh, looking at increasing physical activity, and study, uh, studies that were published uh, more than 20 years ago or did not evaluate the effectiveness of the intervention. For example, we excluded implementation um, guides or planning guides. For uh, each study, we used a critical appraisal tool that was specific to the study designs. As you can see here, we used um, these tools across um, this table. So access CASP uh, for both uh, case control and cohort studies, the trend checklist and the um, uh, critical appraisal tool from health evidence. For each tool, the total scores were divided into three equivalent categories. And we used um, guidance from the health evidence tool to categorize those studies as weak, moderate, or strong.
Data were extracted from all studies and synthesized by intervention type. This included bicycle interventions, vehicle interventions, or those interventions that were specific for pedestrians. For each intervention, we created a summary of the outcomes uh, from the specific results in each study. If studies reported the same outcome and effect measure, we tried to group and present the results in a range. If the studies presented similar but unique outcomes, so for example, if they made a discern between all vehicle collisions, um, pedestrian collisions, and fatal collisions, we tried to keep the, the results separate. And where studies reported any measures of variability, including confidence intervals, we presented these with the specific data from the studies. We conducted several key informant interviews with the end users um, along the process, specifically at the beginning of the, the project to provide us not only with uh, scope for the project, but also context to the tools development. We hosted several Chase uh, stakeholder team meetings during the development of the tool. And the information that we were really interested in gathering was um, information on content. So what content should we share on the site? Um, the type of user interactivity that would be beneficial for the, the tool, as well as um, how the user would navigate the tool and what the tool actually looked like. So visualization of the tool itself. We also consulted, as I mentioned, with our digital design team at the University of British Columbia to use their expertise on the final development of the site. So there were a total of 118 studies that were included from the hundreds of studies from the environmental scan. There was a total of 48 interventions included in the tool. 10 of those were specific to bicycles, 26 specific to vehicles, and 12 for pedestrians. This is a, a screenshot of the tool itself. I really wanted to actually show you the tool and to interact with the tool on this presentation, but just given the time constraints, I thought it would be a lot more efficient just to show you some screenshots. But I would really hope for you to check out the tool. It's at www.projectchase.ca. Um, so this is the landing page of the Chase tool. And it has the ability to search for interventions using a search bar. There's also um, a way of navigating the tool by looking at all of the bicycle interventions, all of the vehicle interventions, as well as the pedestrian interventions. And users also wanted to see this tool visually. And so each of the graphics that are on the site, as you can see here through this screenshot, actually function as a GIF. So when you see the road user on the page, you can actually follow the road user, either pedestrian, a bicycle, or a car, navigating the intervention over a 20 second clip. Further, the feedback from the key informant interviews and consultation process suggested that the tool describe the intervention. So you can see at the top here, the intervention is an advanced stop or yield line, and you can see a description of the intervention at the top, where uh, feedback suggested that language or taxonomy that's used across sectors and municipalities uh, varies significantly by this in the same intervention. So we thought it would be very useful to describe the intervention as well as demonstrating it visually um, on the uh, right side of the screen. As you can see, we included the study designs, the number of studies in the study type, the quality of studies, so what the study scored on the critical appraisal. And then we provided an interpretation of the effect estimates from the pooled results of studies. You can see here, I, I cut it with, uh, with the, the screenshot, but there's actually the study locations provided on the tool as well, so where the studies were actually conducted. So the, there is also a table which provides a summary of evidence um, from the studies themselves. You can see here, this is again for advanced stop and yield signs um, that reports on the collision outcome or collision pathway outcome. And you can see here, we've also provided um, the references for the studies that were included in the tool. It was also um, significant feedback from our end users that we should provide some information on how to use the tool. So there are pages on the tool that demonstrate how to use the tool and how to interpret the effect estimates included in the tool. So there are some strengths and limitations to this work. The first is that 
uh, to our knowledge, this is the first synthesis and accessible resource that summarizes evidence on the effectiveness of built environment interventions that are found in municipal road safety policies in the uh, municipalities participating in CHASE. We used a targeted literature search with a comprehensive search strategy and a critical appraisal process that included information on the quality of study reporting and the translation of information. There are some limitations to this work, and that includes our inability to access localized collision evaluation reports. Um, we also included all study designs. Of course, this presents some difficulty in comparing results across studies. Um, and we did notice that using some of the critical appraisal tools, particularly the trend checklist, uh, was a bit challenging in determining the quality of reporting given the fit for the tool and the study design. And of course, there are limitations within the studies themselves. There was often no control group for uh, comparison, as well as there were several studies that did not report measures of variability around the effect estimates. So what we have learned through this project, as well as developing several CHASE uh, project, is that what is quite key to supporting public health practitioners and road safety practitioners is to provide accessible evidence uh, and data. Uh, they use this in, a, in their local road safety programming development and their program of public health. And we really need information to share information specifically on the variability in the effectiveness of interventions when we're making decisions for population level impact. Thank you so much for your time. Again, just a shout out to the Chase webinar that's happening in October. I hope you all can attend that where we'll be able to show the tool and interact with the tool. Also hope that you go and visit the tool um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, one question that came up, uh, it was asked, had you um, included road diets? Yes, road diets is in the tool. I, um, yeah, <laughs> that's an easy question. I wish I could show you the information specific to road diets. I don't think we have time for that though. <laughs> no, sadly, I mean, um, Etienne Krug talked this morning about how we have to um, address transportation and safety and prioritize it much more. We've had an, uh, six speakers come forward and tell us how, um, how to get data, what kinds of things we can look at, what kinds of things we can try. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to do. It's unfortunate we didn't have much time for questions because that could have been very interesting. Um, but uh, I wanna thank you all for sharing your information with us and for helping us stay on time. That was great given this was the first session and we don't wanna fall behind too, too far. Um, I just wanna, um, Remind people that uh, after the events, you can go to the exhibition hall. There's the gamification um, that's going on and you can win prizes. So you might uh, consider doing that. Again, my thank you to all the speakers and um, look forward to seeing you at some point through the rest of the conference. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.